Um, so yeah, welcome to our EED seminar series. And it is, yeah, a great honor to have Professor Lou uh, Santiago from UC Riverside to make the talk to us. Lou has uh, been an inspiration to me my whole career. You know, he uh, started, actually was born in Hawaii and then grew up in Northern California, so he's very local, but then went to do his master's degree in Hawaii with legendary hydrolysis here in Goldstein and did, uh, you know, early sap flow measurements a metro center is probably more of it. So later when I was a faculty in Hawaii, I was in a retrace of his footsteps doing that with my students. Um, we went to do his PhD with another legendary plant ecophysiologist, uh, Steve Mulkey at University of Florida. Um, and oh yeah, one point about Lou is he's consistently worked in the tropics, which as you know, very difficult place to work, but you know, 99% of the biology happens there. It's always an inspiration that people do this kind of high level fundamental work there. So I uh, did this PhD uh, at the University of Florida working in the tropics and then went to Berkeley to do his postdoc at, at Pod Dawson. Um, and then he's been at UC Riverside for 17 years. So like I said, yeah, Lou is you know, very well known around the world for fundamental discoveries in plant water relations and hydraulics and equally in plant nutrient responses both at small scale, looking at individual plants, but also at patterns, like full ecological patterns, you know, within forests and I would say regionally. And then lately getting very involved in human impacts on ecosystems. Um, so yeah, it's a great honor to have you. And really excited. Thanks. Thanks, Lauren. And I just wanna say it's great to be back in UCLA. There was a time when we were both assistant professors where we would just make the drive and just to get together and talk sometimes. And as we've gone on and gotten busier and gotten more students, it doesn't happen. And so I'm glad to be here and glad to have some time to just chat. So um, thanks for inviting me and I'll get started. So today I'm gonna to talk about drought survival strategies of woody plants. So there we go. So a little bit about the way I approach science. So I view my science as linking these two areas of ecology. One is plant physiological ecology, where we really work at a small scale on individuals and we take individual based measurements. Um, often in the world of ecophysiology, we're measuring environmental responses, um, often in an evolutionary context. And ultimately, what we're often measuring are matter and energy fluxes. And those same matter and energy fluxes are relevant at bigger scales and link us to ecosystem science, where we consider those matter and energy fluxes in terms of biogeochemical cycles and how they determine plant life zones. And that, again, feeds back into physiological ecology. So that's kind of where I sit. I also wanted to introduce some of the research sites I work in. The research sites I work in are really inspirational to me. Um, they're all special places. And all the data I'll be showing you today come from one of these four places that I've worked in a long time. Um, the top one up here is Paracou Forest in French Guiana. And that's kind of the newest site I've been working in. I've only been working there for about eight or nine years. Um, and it's a really exciting place to work. It's, it's Amazonian forest. Um, but it's eastern Amazonia, so the soils are poor, um, they're really weathered. Um, the trees grow about 30 meters tall, but they're spindly compared to other tropical forests I've been in. And it's just wild. You know, when you step off the road in Paracu and enter into the forest, you know there's no roads for thousands of kilometers going forward from where you are. So you don't want to get lost. It's really a magical sight. The, the upper photo on the right, that's Morongo Valley. Um, so this is on the backside of the San Bernardino Mountains, and we found a site there around 1,200 meters where um, the chaparral coming off the mountain grades into Mojave Desert. And at this margin, it, it's a really fascinating place to work. You've got species that are chaparral, you have desert species, you have sky island species, and you have some species that only occur along this margin. Um, so we think it has a lot of potential um, for changes as the climate changes, a lot of species on the edges of their range. This down here is Dibel Chaltoon National Park in the Yucatan Peninsula. I did a postdoc there in 2004 um, at the CC Institute in Mexico, and I continue to work there. I, I've got great collaborators there, and I've continued to work there on and off um, since I did my postdoc there. Um, this is an ancient Mayan site where on the equinox of um, spring and, and 
fall, the sun rises right through that, through that temple there. And so um, in my work there, I've gotten more and more into thinking about the forest, um, the ancient Mayans, how they live together and how the Mayans basically transform that forest into something that was useful for them. And when we walk around in it today, it looks like a regular natural tropical forest. It's not, there's a super high proportion of useful plants there. Okay, and then over on the bottom right, that's Barrow, Colorado Island in Panama. This is where I did my dissertation research and it's kind of what I consider my, my home field, my, my home site. I've, I've gone back there since I started, I visited there first as a master's student in 97 and kind of never looked back. I've always been involved in things going on there ever since. So what you'll see um, as I talk about these strategies and plants um, is kind of a smattering of data from these different sites. So the context of my work um, basically falls into this red box. And so what I see going on is that atmospheric CO2 is increasing. This is changing our climate and it's responsible for extreme climatic events such as drought. And when there's a drought, we often have some level of mortality among the plants there. But that mortality is mediated through this red box. It's mediated through the individual drought survival traits of the species that that drought passes through. And so understanding how those drought survival traits lead to strategies and lead to how plants actually deal with drought and the many ways they do that is really the key piece of the puzzle here for me. And the challenge is there's so many species, each one has its own individual idiosyncratic response to drought. And that's why this, this problem of predicting which species are going to survive drought is such a complicated problem. And so I'll start getting into how I want to address that. Um, this is important at larger scales because the biomass loss from mortality um, from drought or any other type of mortality events ends up decomposing and is another pathway of CO2 back into the atmosphere. Okay, drought survival traits. So a few years ago, maybe a little more than a few years ago now, my graduate students and I were sitting down and trying to piece together how we represent strategies of plants in response to drought using their traits. Okay, and we had been through a lot of the literature on this. Um, there's some very good literature out there classifying species as drought avoiders or drought tolerators in these classification schemes. And as we went through this, we always found some species that we couldn't fit neatly into a box or we could fit them in the box, but they were at the edge of the box, almost like they should be in the box next to it. And that's a problem with discrete classifications. So um, with some of these species, we got confused and we decided to take a whole new approach and say, okay, let's not classify anything in any category. Why don't we just go through what we think are the key traits that allow species to survive drought? What are the key features that some species have and some don't that allow them to survive drought? And so we came up with this list and this list is always changing. And every time I give this talk, somebody comes in and says, hey, you know, I've got a trait that should be on your list or, um, or there's one trait that shouldn't be on your list because it, it doesn't quite fit. Um, and so if anyone has any traits they wanna talk about, let me know, we can do that. I'm just gonna go through these. So the first obvious one is an embolism resistant xylem. The plant vascular system will fail um, under, very um, under very low pressures, under negative pressures. And so each plant has particular values at which components of the hydraulic system will fail. And so that's characterized with embolism resistant xylem. Um, capacitance represents the stored water in stems and how that can be mobilized as there are local drops in water potential. Okay, and so that's kind of a short term feature for dealing with drought. Drought deciduousness, well, when a plant loses all of its leaves, it's lost its area for transpiring water. And so this is one of the ways plants can seasonally reduce their water loss by losing their leaves during a dry season. Um, some plants are more opportunistic and they lose their leaves when there's a drought. Um, so there's a whole range of behaviors there. Uh, photosynthetic stems is something we consider important. Many Drought deciduous species, when they lose their leaves, they continue photosynthesizing through their stems. And so if there's a very long drought, um, especially many desert plants or tropical dry forest plants, they will just keep their leaves off. They have a carbon income through their stems, often at a greater water use efficiency than leaves. And so this is one effective way to maintain their physiology, even if a drought is long 
and they're um, not having any voter synthesized. Okay, deep roots is probably the most obvious one, right? Keep going down, there's gonna be some water there, hopefully. Um, plants vary incredibly in their rooting depth. And so characterizing rooting depth, which is difficult to do, can tell us a lot about how plants are gonna fare during drought. Okay, regulation of gas exchange. Um, this is more difficult to quantify, but this basically represents uh, plants taking advantage of um, the movement of their stomata, opening and closing, opening when conditions are opportunistic for carbon gain, when humidity is relatively high and light is high, um, closing those stomates um, at times when uh, evaporative demand is very high and the equation of um, carbon gain versus water loss is not in their favor. So opportunistic opening and closing of stomata is what we have there. Water storage organs, okay? Um, this seems like an obvious one. It wasn't on my list for a long time. Brett Wolf finally convinced me to put this on. Um, many plants have um, water storage somewhere e either in their tissues. Um, some have a layer between their bark um, and the inner part of their stem. So there's a variety of ways that plants deal with this. Often tropical dry forest trees um, which occur in these very seasonal environments tend to have these, I think of like savas, you know? Um, and then many plants have, um, have root storage structures. So many of our chaparral actually have um, this big root that uh, responds to fire, but it's also a big structure underground that stores water, okay? Um, effective osmotic control is something we can talk about a little bit and something you've probably heard a lot about um, with Lauren measuring trigger loss point. Um, plants can adjust the osmotic components of their cells and they can adjust their trigger loss point. And the more measurements we take of this, we're seeing that they do this quite frequently through different seasons, okay? Um, and then finally, a low cuticle conductance. When, when the plant has lost its leaves or closed its stomates, um, it's really kind of hunkered down for a drought and it's waiting. Um, there is a slow, there's a very low rate of water loss through plant cuticles. So even when everything's shut down, there's still a little bit of water being lost. And in a long drought, that effectively is draining at a very low rate, the internal pool of water. Um, so this is kind of, kind of the ultimate defense. And at one time going, going back, you know, it was something that we knew happened, but we didn't really appreciate the variation among species. And now that there's so much more data, we can see that there's a lot of variation in terms of cuticle conductance. I think we're still linking that um, to strategies and seeing if it's uh, advantageous. And there's some trade-offs there I'll show you later on in the talk, um, but that, that's an important one that's gaining traction now. Okay, and so what is a strategy? This is something when, you know, any ecologists in here who ever play around with the word strategy, you always get, you know, what do you mean by strategy? So I define a strategy as the composition of these traits. And every species has some of these traits and not others, okay? And so it's kind of like a scorecard, you can think of it. Um, I got this one, I got that one, I don't have this one. And whatever the composition of traits leads to a certain behavior during drought. Okay, and so that's what I consider strategies. Okay, um, a little bit of background about water transport and trees. Who, who here is in Lauren's lab? Okay, I'm not in Lauren's lab. Okay, so a few of you are. You know this stuff um, cold, um, but um, for the rest of you, I'm gonna go through a little bit of basics about water transport and trees, a little plant physiology, um, so that the rest of my data in this talk makes sense. And so here um, we have a tree and we have um, water moving up the tree vertically through our roots, stem, and the leaves, and it's moving along a water potential gradient. Okay, so here in the soil, we're about minus 0.3 megapascals, and we're moving up to our leaves and eventually transpiring into our outside air, which is very dry. Okay, as this water is being transported up the stem, it's being transported um, along a chain of molecules. So there's cohesion among that chain of molecules. There's hydrogen bonding among those water molecules. And at certain water potentials, um, this transport can fail. Now, at one time, biologists thought that the tensions were strong enough to break the hydrogen bond, okay? That's not the case. We found out that's not what happens. What actually happens is the tension gets low enough that um, pits in the side of the xylem pull air inside. And with that low tension, that air bubble grows and will block the xylem, okay? Um, this is often a temporary uh, issue that can be 
can be cured, vessels can be refilled. Okay, that's still somewhat of a mysterious process in our field that's um, kind of on the frontier of hydraulics right now. Um, but that's basically what we're talking about when plants have um, an embolism in their xylem. Okay, and so that's what we're working against in drought. Now, um, that looks something like this. Here is uh, an enlargement of a, a pit, and these occur in the sides of the vessels. And so when you have a what here in this case you have water at minus five megapascals so that water is under tension and it's next to an air-filled space it will eventually suck that air inside okay and so every plant has particular values particular critical pressures at which that air will get sucked through and that's one of the things we're trying to characterize when we talk about embolism resistance of xylem okay and so that's what we're seeing here. An air bubble is formed. Um, the water flow has found a, a side pit that it can go through and can still transport water, but it's lost some of its water transport capacity there because of that air bubble that's been aspirated into the Zion vessel. Okay, um, I mentioned refilling. There are some theories about how things can be refilled and the idea goes something like this. Um, so a vessel becomes embolized and the live cells, the parenchyma cells that are adjacent to a xylem vessel will start pumping some solvents into that space, um, which will allow water to start collecting along the wall. Okay. They'll send out some water, they'll send out some solutes, um, it'll pull it out um, of, of these vessels, and eventually you have enough um, water in here that it's able to squeeze down in that air bubble. Okay, and it will go back into solution. That's our theory. Um, people are looking at this with imaging. It's very hard to find. We know it happens um, because you can measure the water potential of, um, of a leaf or measure the conductivity of a stem and, in the evening, and it can have a um, high degree of cavitation. And in the morning, that same plant is fully hydrated. So, so we know this happens. Um, and this is our kind of best guess based on all the evidence of how it actually happens. Okay, so um, a xylem vessel cavitating is not catastrophic drought failure. If many of them cavitate somewhere along the lines of 85% or so, depending on the species, then you could have that shoot actually fail completely. Okay. All right, so how do we characterize this? And I'm starting out with embolism resistance and stems because I think it's one of the really fundamental ways to measure drought resistance. Uh, a plant that loses water transport capacity in its stem, if it's the main stem, it, it's not going to make it, right? And so this is a way to, to really kind of get at the conditions under which a plant could be headed towards mortality. And so what do we see here? So this is our fraction of maximum conductivity here, the water movement through the xylem, and this is water potential becoming um, more desiccated, more negative. negative value there. And so if we compare these curves here, for example, we have a more resistant species. Um, it, it maintains more of its conductivity as water potential drop. Here's a more vulnerable species. And this is how we compare species with this measure. We often look at the P50, um, which is our water potential at which we get 50% loss of conductivity. And so this would be it for these two species. Okay, so this is a way to characterize different species with these curves. These curves vary a lot. And so this is just kind of one point that we measure um, to, to compare them. There's a lot packed into this curve that isn't being used in the literature at the moment. Okay, um, people often ask how we do this. So first, um, if I'm working on tropical plants, really you need canopy samples to be able to do this correctly. So we use the canopy crane um, to get samples from the upper canopy, okay? Um, in French Guiana, we have a tree climber. Um, that's is Jocelyn Casal, um, who is absolutely amazing. He can get samples from four or five canopy trees before noon. And so we can have those samples and be heading back to the lab um, around one o'clock, um, ready to measure. He is simply amazing. And we're talking about two or three meter long branches from the upper canopy, okay? Um, we bring those down, we, um, we cover the cut end, we double bag them. Um, we're basically preserving their hydraulic state to get them back to the lab. 
in a couple hours, and then we'll work on them for the next couple of days as they dry down to develop these curves, right? Um, it does look like a body bag, and we we were stopped by the gendarmes um, in French Guiana, um, and I think this had something to do with it. They kind of just looked in the back and let us go. Um, but yeah, they're about they're about my my size, and um, okay. So once we get them back to the lab, we are going to measure their hydraulic conductivity for one of our actions. Measuring water potential is easy. We just pick off a leaf and put it in the pressure chamber. The measuring conductivity is much more difficult. So this is something like what we use, and we basically have an elevated source of water, um, and we have a series of hoses that push this through a stem sink. Okay, and so we're getting our rate of water flow. And as the water potential declines, that rate of water flow is going to go down. Each stem, we're going to measure its maximum rate. At the end, we're just going to flush water through it with high pressure and get a maximum rate to characterize how much of its conductivity had been lost. Um, but this is essentially what we do once we get back to the lab with these samples. Um, this is what it can look like in real life, which is kind of messy. Um, here we were in French Guiana in a field lab. So we're doing this with uh, pipettes and stopwatches. Um, you know, for this, we didn't, we didn't even need electricity, really. We just need a, a good good water filter and some hoses are all we need for this. So um, this is what some, some of our work like, look like there. Okay, and this is what we end up with. So here um, for Paracu and French Guiana, we've measured 14 species. And we stratified by wood density. So the density of wood has a huge bearing on xylem embolism and xylem conductivity, especially maximum conductivity. And so um, we believe that because we, we measured the most dense and the least dense species on this plot that has about 300 species, that we've actually constrained the range. Um, we haven't, these are very time consuming measurements. And so 14 species took us, um, it took us four months over two years. And so we made two trips to do this. So very time consuming, really valuable data. Um, it, it'd be really hard to measure all 300 species, but we, we think we've kind of constrained this to characterize the site. Um, there's not much variation, actually, I would say, compared to other sites I've seen. Um, this is another example of this kind of work comparing uh, lianas and trees in Panama. Um, here we have six lianas and six trees, and we were able to show that the lianas are more vulnerable than the trees. Not much more. Again, in tropical forests, these the, the variation in these values are, are fairly constrained. And I say this because compared to our Morongo Valley site, which has um, 16 woody species, and we just measure them all, um, there's a huge range. So we've got uh, juniper out here, which we, we don't have the instruments to get to the point where it goes to zero. Um, juniper is well known as one of the most resistant species for, for its xylem. And so, um, and then in contrast here, we have Russo Vada. Russo Vada um, appears to have really deep roots and doesn't seem to care about the drought. Um, it'll photosynthesize when things are dry and there hasn't been any rain in months. Russo Vada um, must have deep roots, at least from some of our isotope measurements, that, that's what it suggests. And so we have a whole range of strategies here. Some of this is aligned along rooting depth um, and the other traits that, that I mentioned earlier, um, but really wide range. And we often see this as we get into tropical ecosystems, as we get into temperate ecosystems in tropics, especially wet tropical forests, all those values tend to be more conservative. Okay, um, I wanna talk about capacitance now because capacitance is something that is often um, exhibiting a trade-off versus xylem embolism resistance. So here we uh, will take a small piece of wood is one way to do it. And we'll um, put it in a psychrometer and create this curve of water release versus sapwood water potential. Again, it's an iterative measurement. So we're letting those samples dry down and then measuring them again. And then we, we take the slope of the linear portion of this curve and we calculate our um, capacitance, which really represents how much water can be moved around per unit water potential. And so a species with a greater amount of capacitance can mobilize water very quickly. If there's a local low in water potential in a stem, it can move water there to compensate for that. And so this is thought to be a short-term way of plants dealing with drought. Um, a hot afternoon when transpiration is happening a lot, 
um, and the water uptake from the, from the roots is not fast enough in that afternoon to really alleviate this. Water can be moved around the stem, okay? And species that have a high capacitance tend to have a low resistance to embolism. And so it's kind of a different way of dealing with this. Um, you, don't, you don't see that many species with a high capacitance and low embolism resistance in ecosystems like California, right? Um, but if you look at sites that are more mesic or humid, you will see this trade-off um, coming very strongly, okay? Because species in wet ecosystems, they may not deal with long seasonal droughts, um, but if it's a warm site and they're transpiring a lot in the day, those short-term deficits in water potential in their tissues um, can be alleviated with a, with a high value for capacitance. And here's an example here showing species with greater capacitance have greater um, midday water status in Panama. So this is a mix of lianas and trees um, done by my former graduate student, Mark de Guzman. And so this is just one example um, of this, of what capacitance can do for some of these species, okay? All right, um, another student of mine, former student, Erica Busior, she got very interested in capacitance and started collating all the data that she could find um, on capacitance, started contacting um, people who had data on this, um, kind of put it all together. And so we're, we're preparing this now, it's a manuscript, that basically pulls together all of the capacitance data that we could find. It's about it's about almost 300 species. Um, and, and so Marcos Bakahevic, who is a um, community ecologist in our lab, uh, in our university, um, he has his own lab. Uh, so he is um, helping, helping us on some phylogenetic analyses in these and basically with our statistics. Um, so we're putting this together and everyone else on here, they're all, they're all collaborators who've contributed data. Many of them had like unpublished data or data that was partially shown in publications. So we contacted them and this is something that's kind of happening now that we're putting together. Okay, drought deciduousness I mentioned. Um, this is a photo of the canopy of um, Pipeline Road in Panama during the dry season. And this is a, uh, a big um, corotu tree that's basically in the process of losing all of its leaves. And it does it every dry season. There are many species that as soon as the dry season comes, they lose their leaves. They, they, they're timed to do this. There are other species that will not drop their leaves unless things get, really get dry. Okay, so there's some opportun opportunistic um, leaf shedders. Um, there's also species that no matter how dry it gets, they will not lose their leaves and they will literally die with their leaves still on and brown, okay? Um, and so there's really, as we started to look at this, um, it's not so clear, you know, to put them in deciduous versus evergreen. There's, there's a lot of categories and then it's really a continuous axis. Okay, if we think about this. So um, as simple as it may seem, this is actually a quite complicated one in tropical forest when you start drilling down into um, the phenology and, and how species are, are losing their leaves. Here in California at our desert chaparral site in Morongo Valley, um, we also measure this and monitored it through the year. And what we found was that, um, let's see here. So the, um, so the black is when species have no leaves. Um, the white is when they have leaves. And um, the gray is um, the gray is when they're photosynthesizing with their stems. So this species, for example, has no, no leaves anytime during the year. It only has photosynthetic stems. Okay. Um, this leaf right here has no leaves here. And then it has leaves for the short time and during this period of photosynthesizing with its green stems. And so when we first looked at this, we only looked at whether they had leaves or not, didn't make that much sense. And then we started to look, considering who has photosynthetic stems and we were able to put together a lot of the story. A really interesting thing about this data set as I take a step back is just the diversity of behaviors um, of these species living all in one site, okay? There's a lot of variation um, for what they're doing. We have, um, let's see, we have Prunus fasciculata here, um, which is a, it's a temperate 
it's a, of temperate origin, um, cold deciduous, uh, in a in a site that um, really you know sh it should have a dry season deciduous leaf phenology. So um, yeah, there's a lot going on here, especially when we start thinking about where these species come from and where their lineages come from. Um, Russovata is a tropical lineage, right? and so evergreen all the time. Um, but I, I guess I'd really put this up here to emphasize how complicated um, the classification of evergreen versus deciduous can be when you really collect data and see what's going on. Okay, photosynthetic stems I mentioned. It's something that I've, you know, every ecophysiologist knows about photosynthetic stems. It's something that's kind of neat. Um, a few years ago, um, Elenis, my former graduate student, entered my lab, and this was what she really wanted to work on. So um, her whole dissertation was about photosynthetic stems, um, characterizing trade-offs within the stem, characterizing differences between leaves and stems in terms of their hydraulics, in terms of their photosynthesis. Um, she has really focused on this area and um, has really become the, you know, the world expert in this area. And so got me thinking about this a lot and, and really prompted me to incorporate this into, uh, into our, our vision of plant drought survival traits. And she is headed for a faculty position at the University of Utah starting in the fall. So doing really good stuff. And this is some of her data. So here, um, let's see. So we have on, on the horizontal axis, we have dry season minimum stomatal conductance. So this is cuticle conductance, if you will. And um, so these are stem, these are all stems. And um, the, the dotted line and the dashed line are wet season and dry season. And this is uh, a mass is mass based photosynthetic CO2 assimilation. And what this is showing is that um, as photosynthesis goes up, minimum conductance also goes up. And so while we always think about photosynthetic stems as having this great benefit of allowing plants to absorb carbon when they don't have leaves, there's also a cost. And this is in Joshua Tree Park. So this is not a wet site. This is a, a really dry site. There is a cost to photosynthesis of stems. And this kind of came about because um, Elenis was always telling me how great it was for plants to have photosynthetic stems. And so eventually I said, well, why don't all plants have photosynthetic stems? There must be a cost. And ooh, a cost, okay, I'm gonna measure the cost. And so she spent a whole summer on this. And, um, and this is kind of the, the best display of this cost of photosynth photosynthesizing in stems. And so this kind of balanced out our, our approach and our thoughts to photosynthetic stems. Yes. Could you unpack that a little bit? What what is happening at the you know the level of the cell window and how big the membrane is of making uh, what is this system? Yeah, um, it's it's likely the structure um, of their mesophyll cells um, just below the epidermis and how that air is able to move through, and so you need that for a high photosynthetic rate, um, and part of the feedback is. Um, having more water evaporate from those tissues when the stomates are closed. So whether that's more air spaces closer to the epidermis, something like that, I, I don't know, actually, we haven't taken the images, but I, I kind of, um, I think it's something like that. So thanks, that's a good question. Okay, um, deep roots, I mentioned. So um, former student Niles Hasselquist uh, did some of this work in, in the Yucatan Peninsula. And the Yucatan Peninsula is really a great place for this because when the dry season comes, you see very clearly species that lose their leaves and species that are evergreen. And you just can't help but think those evergreen species have a water source below. They must have deeper roots, right? And so um, this is uh, some, some data that was collected. So the way that we are able to estimate the depth of water uptake is with, by using isotopes. And you can see in this graph here, um, what happens is at the top of the soil, you have evaporation from the upper soil layers. And as water evaporates, the lighter isotopes are lost first. So the O16 is lost and it leaves behind a little more concentrated assemblage of O18, our heavy isotopes. And so you can see up at the top, you start getting a more heavy signature. And then as you go down through the soil, that's lost until here when it converges with 
um, this half bar is that's the well water. So that's nine meters down. Um, we had a well, we measured the water there. We measured the water down to two meters of soil or three meters of soil. And we found it's kind of converging with the, with the well water there. So we didn't go any deeper. Um, that worked out. And so then we take a sample of the xylem of our plants, any non-transpiring tissue, and we're able to match the depth of water uptake at that time, okay? That can differ. Plants are not always taking up water from the same rate. Um, but what this did is it allowed us to really look at this question. Everyone in tropical biology will say, oh, you know, it's evergreen has got deeper roots, easy. And so what we were able to find was um, that is true, but only in the first 15 years of succession. So after forests were more than 15 years old, there was no difference in the rooting depth of evergreens and deciduous trees, okay? And so that, that was a big finding. So it's really when they're getting established in, in those first 15 years of the tree is when that difference matters a lot. Um, after that, the deciduous trees are also getting down um, to the same depth as the evergreen trees, okay? And we like doing this because tropical biology is full of these things that everyone believes and there's no data for it, so. Okay, um, regulation of gas exchange. I, I put this up here. Um, so these are many, many different species all these plots, but they're all the same. It is um, stomatal conductance on the vertical axis versus water potential on the horizontal. And so as water potential drops this way, stomatal conductance is dropping out. This is all the species. And so this is a group of species uh, that occur at our chaparral site in Southern California. And this is Alex who collected this data. Um, Alex was here at UCLA as a Lacretz postdoc a few years ago, and she is starting in the fall at Occidental College. Um, so she'll be right around the corner at, at Oxy, um, starting a faculty position there. So um, I put this up just to show the large variation in all these species growing together. And this was data that was taken um, during the year of the Great California Drought around 2015. So that drought was 2012 to 2016. And so, um, so keep that in mind as you look at this data, there's just a tremendous amount of variation. Some species are actually keeping their stomachs up in a measurable stomach conductance down below minus six megapascals. And the editors at the journal, um, they actually really questioned us on this. They, um, they so one of the reviewers said, you can't have stomatal conductance at minus six megapascals. That's just impossible, okay? Um, but over and over again, that's what our instruments told us. And turns out that um, the editor actually acknowledged that that reviewer was from a place where they don't get water potentials that low. Um, so, it was difficult going back and forth, um, but we, we were able to show this. And so in this one ecosystem, all these chaparral plants, they're doing some quite different things. Some are continuing water potential, uh, continuing stomatal conductance down to near minus nine megapascals of water potential. Many of them just shut down right away. You don't get anything um, after about minus two. And so huge variation there. Okay, we've also done something similar in avocado. So um, Riverside has a huge avocado breeding program and for breeding programs, you need variety trials. So we have a field with 40 or 50 different varieties of avocado. We went and measured, I think this is 24 of them and looked at their carbon isotope values of their leaf. And this relates to water use efficiency. So um, when stomates are relatively more closed, um, Rubisco will take more and more of the heavy isotope, okay? And when stomates are, are relatively more closed, um, you also have a greater water use efficiency because nonlinearities between stomatal conductance and, and photosynthesis. And so um, here, uh, values that are higher around minus 28 show greater water use efficiency. Values that are much lower, they're, they're blowing out water. Minus 33 is blowing out water, really. It's almost like a shade value. And so, um, so we measure all these and the idea, you know, we're growing, Cal we're growing avocados in California. It's kind of a signature crop of California. It uses way too much water, okay? And so look, trying to look for more um, water use efficient varieties to breed into our Haas. Haas here um, and the mother Haas are 
about nine about they're about ninety percent of our avocado industry in California, and um, they're they're not bad though actually. So they're they're on the more on the efficient side. Um, but Carmen is being tested right now. So we have a mapping population of Carmen to try to get start getting specifically um, at the genes behind the traits that make it an efficient water user. And we also, some, way over here on the other side, um, these are very high productivity species. They grow fast. They're using a lot of water, but they do grow fast. So at the other end of this is yield. Um, we can use a more water efficient variety, but if it's not, if it's not providing the yield of avocados, it may not be um, a benefit. Although saving water is always a benefit, there's some economics at play there. This was done by my former graduate student, um, Leda Acosta Rangel, um, who is now at the University of South Florida. Okay, um, in terms of regulating gas exchange, uh, we also looked at this in French Guiana. And so this is some of conductance and measured in wet season and dry season. And uh, this was all done by rope by Clement Stahl. So um, hats off to him. This was, was not, e not easy measuring gas exchange um, using traditional climbing here. And, uh, you know, we measured, I, I think this is, you know, 10 or 12 species. And the result, I put this up because the results really surprised us. So we had um, the green species are doing what we expect them to do. Um, in the middle of the wet season, their stomatal conductance is higher. By the end of the dry season, it's lower, right? So they're closing their stomata more during the dry season. This is midday stomatal conductance. And so, okay, that makes sense. And then we have a few species that are actually increasing their stomatal conductance from the wet season to the dry season. We think, okay, um, there's more light available in the dry season, and this forest is pretty cloudy and wet all year, 3,000 millimeters of rainfall. So they're maximizing carbon gain during that short dry season, which really isn't that dry anyway. Um, there, there's water down there. So, um, so we can we can plan out, okay? Um, but then there are these species that have really low stomatal conductance, and they pretty much don't really change much. Um, these are very conservative species. They're slow growing um, conservative species that are late successional and their gas exchange doesn't change much through the year at all. They just constantly crank away at their own rate um, and they suffer relatively low mortality. These are species with high wood density, evergreen leaves, slow moving, but persistent. And so just in a simple analysis like this, we get so many different, so many different behaviors. And so um, this is why putting these traits together and looking at the individual behaviors of species for all these traits really can give us a comprehensive picture of their strategies. Okay, water storage organs. Um, this is Elenis again, and this is data from her thesis collected in Baja, California. And so what you see here, um, in this graph is the change in um, stem specific area from the wet season to the dry season. And so this is um, basically your outer area of stem divided by the, by, um, the mass of that stem. And it changes up to almost 20% in some species. And when we, looked at, when we looked at other data, some of their hydraulic data and photosynthetic data, it just did not make sense. Um, and until we realized that these species are shrinking and swelling with the seasons. And so that kind of put everything in perspective. We were uh, expressing photosynthesis at the stem scale um, and using stem specific area to do that. Well, that's changing all through the year is what we eventually realized. And these plants are storing, they're storing a lot of water in their stem seasonally. They, they bulk up by the end of the wet season and then they slowly deplete it as the dry season continues on. And so, um, so this is, uh, and you know, I know there are species that do this, but I've never seen an ecosystem where almost every woody species does it. And so that was, that's really remarkable here. Okay, um, I mentioned osmotic control. Many of you are familiar with this, this is basic biology, right? Um, if you have, um, you have the water potential of tissues go below a certain level, um, your plant cells will lose turgor. This is a plant that's wilting. That's in the botanical garden. Uh, it's in a botanical garden in the Yucatan. Really dry forest there. 
um, wilt happens when plants reach a particular value for turgor loss point. Okay. And I know Lauren, Lauren's lab basically developed a method for doing this rapidly that's now being used in many places. So we have this wealth of turgor loss point data from many, many species now, which is really valuable in this analysis um, that I'm doing. I'm trying to incorporate that data um, because this really represents, it doesn't represent mortality, um, but it represents the leaf's ability to withstand drought. And although that water potential doesn't mean death for the plant, it's correlated with, with xylem resistance embolism. So a plant that loses its turgor in its leaves at a relatively high water potential is also going to be in more risk for drought when it happens. So it, it's correlative, but predictive. Okay, and an example from my lab, um, Leon Schoenbeck, who's a postdoc, um, who some of you met at uh, Gordon, you know, she was there. Um, she's been measuring um, a bunch of things in the chaparral, but one of the things that she found um, was that um, seasonal turgor loss was happening in a couple of these species. And so um, here in Corpus and Salvia mellifera, um, oh, and also Spionothus especially, we're getting values of turgor loss point. Uh, we're getting values of water potential in the end of the dry season that are far below the turgor loss point that we measure. Okay. And um, they're, they're sitting far below this. And this, this was really interesting. The first time she showed this, um, people thought that this meant that the plant was going to die. Um, these plants do it every year. They, they drop their water potentials to very low values um, compared to their trigger loss points. So they effectively are having um, wilted leaves on the plant, um, sometimes for a couple of months, and then they're able to rehydrate when the rains come. Um, there's another species. There, yeah, we have data for another species that does this too. Um, but this was you know, part of her study, she's focusing on these six species. We also have plants in the greenhouse of these, and she, she's gone a little bit deeper um, into this question. And so it's finishing up her project right now. She is heading to a position in Lund, Sweden, um, starting this summer. Okay. Um, and then I had to throw something in about my vernal pools, because this is a lot of the work that we're doing currently. Um, during the pandemic, we were approached by Fish and Wildlife, and we now have several contracts with them to work on vernal pools. Um, and these are really close to our campus, about a half hour away up in Hemet, in that valley there. And um, these are pools that they, they fill um, seasonally when there's rain. And this year, there was a lot of rain. The unique thing about these pools is that they're also saline. And so they differ in many ways from, you know, the Jepson Prairie and the more famous vernal pools in California. Um, it's a saline soil. And there's a whole bunch of endangered species in here. Fish and wildlife doesn't really know how to manage them. They have funds. They have people. They don't know what the plants need. And so our job is to do experiments on these endangered plants, endangered species inside of our greenhouse to really determine their basic biology and their habitat requirements, okay? Um, at a site near here, at a wildlife refuge, the manager can turn on and off the water to parcels, let the pools fill, let them drain out. Don't know how much water to put in. They don't know how long to have them inundated, okay? So questions like that. So we're doing things like inundating seedlings for different amounts of time to look at their optimum inundation, see, um, at what inundation time do they grow the most? Do they have the most photosynthetic rate when they come out of that? And so this is a project being led by Humera Mirza, um, one of my graduate students, and I don't have a photo of her. Um, she's a second year graduate student right now and basically manages this project. And um, it does actually get towards osmotic control because um, in, the, uh, in the pools, as they dry down, those salts become concentrated. And so there are huge osmotic changes in these species as they dry down, okay? Um, and so much more. I'll be talking about this more within a couple of years once we have all the data. Okay, um, finally, um, back to cuticle conductance. So um, this is a lot of it. A lot of data on cuticle conductance came out of the study in Joshua Tree. And so I just wanted to um, show you an example of this here because we have, um, we have leaves and stems of green stem plants and non-green stem 
And there's, there's a lot of variation here. These are all very low rates, but there is variation. And one of the most interesting things of this graph is that the green stems here in this particular month have a higher cuticle conductance than even leaves in the sun. Okay. So these green stems, even when their stomata are closed, can actually lose more water than leaves in some species. And so um, this was really like a what? So we we she went back and did some verification measurements, and it was true. Um, the green stems of these plants with photosynthetic stems can have huge cuticle conductances more than leaves. So that was a big surprise to us. And I think there's I think there's more to study here in terms of cuticle conductance. There was a meta-analysis that came out about this a couple of years ago that tied together the data that's available. Um, but I think we still need to incorporate that into our vision of drought traits. Okay, so the next step of what we've been doing, um, and I presented this at a conference a few years ago, is starting to look at coordination among traits. So if we're gonna get at what are the strategies, we need to look at certain traits do they occur together? And does their common occurrence lead to a certain behavior during a drought? And so as I started looking at these correlations mathematically, um, it became apparent that an evergreen phenology and a deciduous phenology, however we characterize that, um, really kind of seem to lead to a number of other traits. And so evergreen species tend to have a resistant xylem, um, tend to not have as much osmotic control, um, tend to have high gas exchange regulation and a low cuticle conductance, um, and they tend to have deeper roots. Um, deciduous species, um, often photosynthetic stems, storage organs, high capacitance. And so the picture is starting to emerge with the kind of spotty data that we have. And so one of the things I hope to do in my sabbatical next year is actually collate data <laughs> Um, much more for all these traits. Most of what we're working with are things that we collected in the lab, um, but a concerted effort to kind of go through the literature and look at these traits in these species and try to parse together what strategies become apparent based on the data, right? That's not based on any a priori classification scheme. So we're going to let the data decide for us what these strategies seem to be based on how these traits coalesce together in different species. And so here's some examples. Um, you know, of what these might look like. So Ceanothus, um, super shallow roots. Many of you in California know it has shallow roots. It has photosynthetic stems and a very embolism resistant xylem, okay? Um, it, just, it just doesn't grow deep roots and its xylem is as resistant as it gets in California, except for juniper. Um, Saba, um, there are some of these probably planted around, are there some plants around this campus? We have them, we have them on campus in Riverside. Um, dry season deciduous. Photosynthetic stems and a water storage organ tissue in between their bark um, and their phloem and xylem that basically expands and contracts with the dry season. And then Quercus, classic deep roots, evergreen, strong regulation of gas exchange. And so those are some of the types that we can start to identify with, with these traits, but we want to do much more with this. Okay. Um, so that's all I have for you today. And I just want to conclude by saying, where do we go from here? So a lot of this is aimed at adding physiological realism to models. If you look at how drought resistance is depicted in earth system models, sometimes it's not very satisfying. We've come a long way. I mean, there is a, um, there's a hydraulic um, component to um, ED2, which is now FATES. And so more and more, these actual traits are being incorporated into these models, which is great, um, but it's not really being used much in terms of strategies and plant functional types. Often tropical forest has one functional type. And so starting to you know, get some variation in there as much as computational limitations will allow, will make these model models more real. Um, you may have gotten the sense that some of these physiological measures are really time consuming. And so, any ways that we have new approaches um, to increase the throughput of physiological measures is a huge benefit. Um, some of what Lauren's done by creating rapid assessment, assessment methods for certain measures is super helpful. Um, stable isotopes, reflectance, transcriptomics, whatever it takes, we need to be able to get physiological data more quickly for more species. 
Okay. And finally, high, high biodiversity is the biggest challenge, okay, especially as someone who works in the tropical forests. Um, but even a like moderately diverse site poses huge challenges for us still. So that's all I have for today. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. That's so much news. So we have uh, yeah. Yeah, thanks for the thought. It's really uh, interesting, and uh, uh, I, I have my questions are really trying to understand the uh, kind of diversity of traits that you are uh, uncovering here. Um, and I guess one general question is, can we say that all of the plants in the communities that you're studying are um, trying to do a first order um, uh, accomplish the same thing that is persist in drought conditions or are some of these species checking out of the drought and then they're just able to come back you know, seeds in a, in a better time, or something, are they escaping through seeds or or something? So, um, yes, if we incorporate like herbaceous species, um, but this this talk is focused on woody plants. Yeah. And so their, their game is to persist. Okay. And so some of them can temporarily check out through um, dry season deciduousness. That's the main way, um, but that's temporary because as a woody plant, they're there for the long term. Um, I guess Ceanothus might be the one it, you know, the, the plants themselves have a relatively short lifespan of, you know, maybe up to 15 or 20 years max, and um, they have fire responsive seeds. So um, when a big fire comes, and they're not deep rooted, right, so they're not investing all of that, they're investing more in seed output for the seeds that will respond to fire. Um, so you see that in California. But when you get away from fire dominated ecosystems, all these woody plants are really in it for the long run. Um, you know, you've got some pioneer trees in tropical forests that get their seeds out really quick before the gap closes. Um, but I have not really, at least in my studies or the way I put things together, come across woody species that are, are ready to check out during drought. Um, and so maybe I need, maybe I should think about that a little bit more and look harder though, because it could be an interesting evolutionary strategy. Yeah, okay, well, that, um, so given that, then uh, it's, I'm wondering if um, the, it, it seems like for some of the species that are studying these, these questions of, of remaining um, need, like just, Generating biomass, and, you know, the, the ability to make communities or to send your roots down to communities uh, is is important for some species or others. So the, the you were saying that the um, perkers or whatever can maintain um, wilted leaves for um, some period of time. So do you have any insight into like why for some? I guess I. I'll, I'll just ask two questions about that that are related. One, like, do you have any insight into why it might be beneficial to hang on to those these things to dehydrate them? And secondly, is, is there like a, is that an example of the continuum of the physiological response of uh, that can explain the evolutionary response of shedding your leaves versus not? Like, is this evolved or is most of these woody plants have like, some duration phase where the leaves are wilted, but could be rejuvenated. And then there's like a physiological decision kind of drop. Yes, absolutely. So, so to your first question, um, could be a benefit to let those leaves wilt and then dehydrate them and bring them back. Because if you lose the leaf, you're losing all, all of that carbon or whatever nutrients, um, all that investment is being lost. So um, if the leaf is, is able to make it not get too damaged, then it could be beneficial to hold on to it. And um, we, we have evidence, Lauren has evidence that as plants, as leaves drop below their turgor loss point, um, a lot of the way that happens preserves the photosynthetic machinery. And um, if it gets extreme enough that the photosynthetic machinery starts to be really damaged, that's more likely that that leaf will go. But in these species that tend to hold on to their leaves below turgor loss point, um, 
it appears that they're able to prevent that damage to their photosynthetic machinery, making it valuable to keep those leaves and not lose those, those resources. So um, I think that's a part of it. And, you know, if we start looking at places that have different lengths of drought, we might start seeing differences in either how those leaves are constructed or where that break point is. So that's a great question. Uh, Alex, and then, yeah. Um, so you said a lot of organization in pacifists and in the ecological vegetables. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, you think about the whole plant, like mm -hmm. the owner of the whole plant, um, how do you know that species would lower or higher the day water table? Because how do you know that that, that would be like allowed in pacifists versus the other plant? Yeah. Yeah, I guess I think of it as the, the capacitance is upstream, so um, and the leaves are downstream, so I tend to think of it in that way. Right. Um, but the capacitance is largely determined by the structure of the wood. And so it, it's fixed. Um, whereas the leaves can open and close their stomatos, their behavior is always varying. And so I guess that's why I think of the leaves as more of a dependent variable um, because the, the amount of capacitance that the, the wood can do is, is fixed. And so that's how I think about it. But I haven't thought much about those feedbacks in terms of stomatal behavior, the water potential of the plant and how that affects that, that behavior of water being moved around the stem. And so yeah, that's kind of hard. something to gnaw on. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have a good answer for you now, but um, interesting thought. That's why we give seminars. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Um, I appreciate how like diverse the number of species in the environment is presented in this talk. I was curious if you looked at all like different drought tolerance strategies within a single species, like on opposite ends of a range or something along that. Like is there Within one species, we do see some variation. Yeah, if you look at uh, like species with large ranges, um, you will see often the ones that are growing in dry areas have enhanced um, drought resistance features. Um, that's definitely true. It gets more tricky when you look within one site um, where you you may have microhabitats, and then the data just gets noisier. So. Um, but I think there's a lot to do there. I've been thinking a lot more about intraspecific variation recently um, because, you know, plants ultimately compete a lot with members of their same species. Um, they need the same resources. They share the same diseases. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of overlap there. And so how those pluses and minuses work out to benefits and costs um, is a really interesting question, which I don't have answers to. Um, but in answer to your question, I think you'll find those patterns if you look at species growing along really wide habitat ranges, and it's most clear in that respect. Yeah, thank you. I have one quick one. Yeah. The uh, capacitance meta analysis that we've seen the results. Was there a correlation with wood density? Pretty strong one. And there, there's an upper limit. So, um, for that relationship as well, yeah. It only includes woody stem capacitance. Yes, leaf capacitance is a whole other ball game, and someone should do that too. Yeah, <laughs> maybe a, maybe like a leaf hydrology lab or something. Yeah. Thank you so much. Dave. Okay, I think we got one more here. Are you already or do you think you'll see with subtle differences between localities where there might be this indication that all the plants that are emerging are specific cocktails of those traits so it could be that there's also more like variation for nesting or something like that that's going to have a to them? Absolutely. I mean, the way plants experience drought in different locations. Um, is it's very 
it's very personal for them, right? It varies a lot depending how things happen, when they happen, what the length of the dry season and how strong it is. And so, yes, absolutely. Um, to the extent that I have data to actually test that, um, that's something that we want to look at and it has come up. So, yeah, thank you. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>